It's that time of week to catch up with our guy, Michael Toop, Line Enquirer basketball analyst. Just caught up with you a few days ago, Mike, but uh, we had a really entertaining game yet again. Illinois goes into overtime with Nebraska. We will talk about some of the concerns that come from that, but uh, just like the Indiana game, they, they find a way to win a game that you didn't necessarily feel completely great about, Mike, especially after that collapse. So what, what was the good that you saw of them being able to pull out a win there? Well, I think we've talked – about this team's experience, how old they are. And in those types of moments, I don't think that they get rattled. Now there's certain things that I think contribute to, to blowing a lead like that. The good was your offensive rebounding because I'm not sure you win that game in regulation if you don't rebound like they did. And, and I think between the, last four minutes of regulation and the overtime, I think you had, I'll call it six offensive rebounds. I think there were four, but you, you drew two fouls on crashing the glass. Hawkins got one, I think with a minute 55 left in, in uh, regulation. And then Gary had one to start off the overtime. And so the reason why that was so important and needed to have those extended offensive possessions, because you were not getting stops. I think you the the less possessions that Nebraska had, the better, because they were scoring virtually every time down, especially in the overtime. So the fact that you were able to compete like that on the glass with some ugly defensive possessions, some ugly offensive possessions, when you had a 40-second offensive possession, like game clock, after Bryce Williams hit that three to make it 72-65, you go from, I think, 312 – to 233 because of your offensive rebounds. Now, if you come down, get a quick shot up, they come down, like they were scoring every time down. So you needed to have as much time on your side as possible. And they did that with their rebounding. All right. The flip side of that, what the hell happened in that final three minutes, Mike, um, both offensively and defensively, as you said, they couldn't stop anybody and they couldn't put any points on the board. Well, to me, a lot of the talk after the game was offensively. And and I think the defensive side of the ball was just as big of a culprit, if not more, in my opinion, because look at the Bryce Williams three. You have Rick Mask rolling to the rim. Quincy Garrier, with the ball coming towards him, is tagging in. That should be the backside guy, not the not the guy that has the ball dribbling towards him. So he's guarding. Uh, he's guarding Alec, I think, in the corner. They go into a dribble handoff with Williams. Now it's Garrier on the switch with Hawkins, and Garrier's tagging in the paint. And so when he's trying to recover out to Williams to switch up, he can't get there in time, gives up a three. So that was the first possession. And then, you know, you go down, and then you have a 40-second offensive possession, like I just talked about, where you're getting two offensive rebounds. Now you settled for two threes. If When you – Damas got a point blank layup that he missed. Mm -hmm. There was some contact, but point blank layup that he missed. So you come down this next time, they get a rebound. Mass outlets it to, to Tominaga. You have Tominaga dribbling up the court. Rogers is kind of riding them up the up the side. And Damask and Gary are hugging their man on the weak side. Gary doesn't even see him. I mean, Tominaga dribbles right down the paint, and Gary is, I think, I had still had Alec. And was kind of just just looking the other way, following him out to the perimeter, where you got to be in those gaps and build walls so that Tony Aga can't can't come down Broadway for a layup. So right there, you're talking about two mistakes, and then you know you have you have the foul on Mass on the next possession, and then Terrence Shannon has a turnover that leads to a Bryce Williams run out for a foul that's 72 71 and then the inbounding as well. So there was a lot there. Um, I think for the, on the offensive side of the ball, you want to do attack matchups at one point, Nebraska showed they were switching one through five. So you said, Hey, Rogers, go set a screen for Damas. Let's get Damask on mast and let's go to work. Damas doesn't really make him pay. He's in the middle of the floor. They're gapped up. He swings it to Shannon who takes a three. And then the next time down, they want to run it again because they think that, that Nebraska is switching one through five. And then, you know, they just keep their matchups. Mass just kind of skinnies up, gets under, 
And then Gary is able to get under and, and level off Shannon. So, you know, the offense looked a little bit disjointed and stagnant, mm -hmm. but the defense, in my opinion, you're not in that position to go into overtime if you're getting stops. If you get stops, that game's over. And and they didn't do that. It also felt like there were some moments in the second half, Mike. They they go on the big runs 47-40, and you felt like you had some chances to to really, you know step on the throats and kudos to Tominaga and, and Mass for, for making some big shots. Uh, but then there was 61 55 and I think you missed six or seven shots in a row. And so I like, you know you're able to get some stops to, to kind of keep that lead, but I felt like those were some big moments too, where they just didn't capitalize for, for whatever reason. But for most of that first, I don't know, 36 minutes, Mike, I, I felt like what they were doing, their process was pretty good. Tomonaga and Mass had, had pretty good games, and Illinois didn't make shots. Um, so the first 36 minutes, I wasn't too bothered, and I felt like at some point they were going to pull away, and they did. They just weren't able to kind of step on Nebraska's throat there at the end. No, and that's why you got to be careful with a team like Nebraska, because four minutes is a lot of time. Three, four, three and a half minutes is a lot of time when you have Tominaga, when you have Mass that can step out, Williams that can step out. Like that lead can evaporate in an instant. And, and we talked about it before the Nebraska game, how combustible this team is offensively and how even when you're up 72-62, you know, the mindset can't be, hey, we have breathing room. The mindset has to be, can we push this to 16? Can we get like one more stop? Because I, if you got one more stop, you won in regulation. Yep. And that was it. And they just just dialing in and locking in um, ends that game. But no, I, I think on the whole, I'm talking about the concerns, you know, we're talking about what happened, the collapse at the end of, of the yeah. of regulation. Uh, but where I'm coming from, I think you got to be happy to get that win and get out of there with a win. That you know, is Indiana, right? Like Indiana and Nebraska. Yeah. Those felt well, like they should have been losses and they weren't. Sure. No, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about the Big Ten race, but these are the ones you just got to find a way, pull them out. Now they're definitely making it more difficult. On, on themselves with the with the way things are are closing out, um, but you have to be happy to come out of here with a win. Where I'm coming from, talking about this is more of a macro level. When you talk about going, I talk about that transition defense with Gary. A, you can't do that at Michigan State, All right? Michigan State's going to be be coming right at you in transition. Um, you know, not being able to locate shooters at times, fighting through like all that stuff matters big picture. If you want to win a Big Ten championship if you want to make some noise in March. Like you, you can't, especially late game. You can't have, um, you know, you can't because I will say you get a stop, right? How about the stop that you get in overtime? Because even overtime started, and there were two straight possessions that Nebraska scored, and then it wasn't until you got a stop that Coleman Hawkins is able to run out and push the push the break, attack mask, get into the paint, kick out to Gary a three. Now you go up four. That's what I'm talking about. If you get one of those stops at the under four, then maybe you can get out and, and and allow yourself to get easier baskets as opposed to having to have to break down in the half court against a set defense that that clogs gaps like that. That's really hard. Is this just a cap tip to to Kese Tominaga breaking out of a slump? I mean, what, what could Illinois have done better against him? Uh, he's incredible. I, I think uh, his he's learned throughout his basketball career how – quickly he has to get his shot off. And I think that surprises some guys where you feel like you're in his airspace, but it's 0.1 seconds he can get that thing off and you're just not close enough. I mean, he had one in overtime where Ty Rogers was literally, I mean, draped all over him and hit it. But we talked about this a little bit last year where when you have a, a lineup with the amount of size that, you know, that, uh, that Illinois has, you know, when you put Terrence Shannon on a opposing point guard, I think it really, really hurts those teams because now you can't quite get to the spots that you want, start offense. It just, it spreads you out like that. That, that is why Terrence is such a weapon defensively, but guys that are six, six guys that are six, seven, even if they have foot speed, it's really hard to navigate off ball screens. We saw that last year at Penn state, you played three games against Penn state. And Andrew Funk hit 14 threes mm -hmm. and, and, you know, so that that is kind of what you have to live with. That's why you have to be completely tuned in to helping when to help, when not to help. And you know, you can't just assume that because you're bigger, you can close out and recover on those type of guys. They just need they just have those quick triggers. So like the 
the rules on on shooters if you don't want a, like a tominaga or funk to get loose there's three things there's three things that you have to keep in mind right off ball actions transition defense and when there is an offensive rebound you better find where the hell that guy's at because mm-hmm. those are the easiest ones the offense rebound kickouts so just moving for I'm, Illinois is fortunate because there just aren't many Tominaga and Funks running around. Right. Um, so I, I don't think it's like a problem down the road. I just think when you play teams like these, you got to do your best to try to limit those guys. Yeah. Um, who would be your star of the game for Illinois? I mean, Coleman, 27 and five with a couple of steals. Ty Rogers, you know, 14 rebounds, eight points, three steals, two blocks. Who is your star of the game there for Illinois? It's. I think you're splitting hairs, but I, I would say Ty Rogers, and the and the reason I say it is, you see what his activity and aggression leads to for this team. I mean, this year, when he has two or more offensive rebounds in a game, they're twelve and two. Hmm. When he scores eight or more points, he, they're nine and zero. Oh. So, like, he's just he adds another wrinkle to this team, and he's doing exactly what he's asked to do. And some, and that's why it's so fun to watch him because of his activity, because of what he values. And then if you listen to Fred Hoiberg after the game, he's sitting up there like he's a hard, tough guard because mm-hmm. you know if you play off of him, now you got one of the best offensive rebounders in the league with a free run to the basket. But if you play on him, you leave more space for these other players. So you know it's I, I like the way they we talked about this, but I, I like the way that they've put him at the five and had him play out those short rolls. What a pass he made to Coleman Hawkins on that short roll where it almost looked like a a design play where he comes out of a short roll and immediately catches it, knows they're going to have that low hold on the bottom. Tominaga's up, skip it right to the corner because that's where the open man's going to be. Hawkins hits a three. Like he just did so much in that game. And, uh, and Coleman did too. Coleman, you know, his, his activity as well. I mean, we've just seen when he's, when he's dialed in, when he's confident, when he's not hesitating, catch and shoot, like th- both those guys are are a big reason for uh, Illinois' success this year, and, and they were, you know, they're a big reason why Illinois won that game the other night. Factors, delicious, ready to eat meals make eating better every day easy. So wherever tomorrow takes you, be ready with pre prepared, chef crafted, and dietitian approved meals from Factor delivered right to your door. You'll have over 35 different options a week to choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and my favorite guys, Protein Plus. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition packed add ons to help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. So, what are you waiting for? Get started today and have a feel good week of meals ready to go. The great part about Factor, they're two minute meals. So, you fuel up fast with Factor's restaurant quality meals. They're ready to heat and eat wherever you are. Plus, they have snacks, smoothies, and more. So, you can discover a wide variety of easy options for the entire day like breakfast midday bites and more and we've done the math sign up and save factor is less expensive than takeout and every meal is dietitian approved to be nutritious and delicious factor is the perfect solution if you're looking for fast upscale options done easily no prep no mess meals factor meals are 100 ready to heat and eat so there's no prepping cooking or cleanup needed so head to factormeals.com slash illini50 and use code illini50 to get 50 percent off your first box and two free wellness shots per box while subscription is active that's code illini50 at factormeals.com slash illini50 to get 50 percent off your first box and two free wellness shots per box while subscription is active it's going to be fun to see we're going to do an all Big Ten team, which is a really difficult exercise midway through the year here. Uh, it's going to be fun to see where we put Coleman here. But over the last 14 games, he's averaging 14.2 points on 42% from three, seven rebounds, and 2.2 steals per game. Um, it's just been fun, man. I, I know we talk about him all the time, but it's it's been fun to see this rise by him. No, it's, it's been really cool to see. I think anytime you have a guy that comes back, there's just a different psychology to it. You've gone to the combine, you had some interviews, you know, you you start to have a little bit more self-assurance when you come back to the college game. And I think we we you know for the most part we've seen that with Terrence this year as well, where you kind of come back, you know who you are and and again, I've gone back and watched that Marquette game. I've gone back and watched games earlier in the year. Coleman was hurt, man. Yeah. He couldn't move he couldn't move it like he is now defensively. Um things were a little bit I think off off kilter offensively, but the more that they've started to figure out 
Like I think the the booty ball and back downs and stuff have really helped Coleman because now you can get more of a sense of where your shots are coming from. Like for him, it's it's it it can kind of come from anywhere. But how many times have you seen Coleman go into a step back three? It's all I was gonna say. It's all step into threes. It's all in rhythm. Whether it's the corner, top of the key, those seem to be his two spots. They're all step into threes. Yeah, I mean percentages are predicated on level of difficulty. Now, not everyone can be Steph Curry or just, you know, come hell or high water, he's going to shoot 40, 40% plus, no matter what the degree of difficulty is. But for, for most guys, the more catch and shoot opportunities you get, Quincy Garrier, like we've seen, and the more rhythm that you have with where those shots are coming, how many are coming per game, you can start to up the percentages. And we, we like, it's never looked broken for Coleman. Yeah, It's just kind of dialing him in. And uh, having him focus on, hey, what are the good ones? And if I shoot good ones, I'll, I'll make a high percentage. And that's just the three-point shooting. I mean, everything else he does, we've we've talked a ton about. And um, he's having a heck of a year, man. Yeah. Kind of goes into the Terrence Shannon conversation. There were some great moments. I mean, two huge threes to get that 10-point lead in the second half. I thought he did a really nice job chasing Tomonaga and fighting through screens, over screens. Uh, but Tomonaga just uh, ha- had a ridiculous day. Uh, but then th- there was some decision making. I thought late it seemed like he, you know, took some out of rhythm ones. Um, what did you think of, of Terrence Shannon? What's his next step? Like, does he feel in rhythm yet to you? Not entirely. I think he has another gear, both offensively and defensively. What's been really interesting about since he's come back is if you want to talk about teams that play like crazy shrink the floor gap help he's played four out of the five since he's come back i mean it's Rutgers, it's nebraska it's northwestern and it's indiana like all of them are just shrink the floor we're not giving you driving gaps and you take that away from a guy like terrence shannon that likes to get downhill that likes to get to the paint now there i thought there were a couple opportunities where he he could have um he made the right play in, in overtime he got you know, a rip drive going down with his left hand, or actually this might have been the end of regulation, um, or I think about a minute and a half left. Left hand driving down the middle of the paint. Tommy Naga's the helper. He's still got Gary on his hip. I, I thought he could have gone up with his left, but he makes a good play with Tommy Naga helping and low holding for a driving kick to the corner to Gary. Gary just misses it. But um, I think he's still getting his feet under him. Ohio State was a good – was a step in the right direction for sure. But I think as as time goes on, that's the hope, right? Is as February will be really important. Try to get him completely back on track so that you can make a run at this thing in March. All right, huge matchup at Michigan State, a quad one opportunity, and that's not going anywhere. Michigan State is firmly a quad one opportunity. National television here, Mike, but most importantly, uh, to stay you know in this race with Purdue, uh, with Wisconsin. Uh, this is. This is where Big Ten championships runs uh, can happen. Uh, but they haven't won a, a marquee uh, game here in a while. So what do you think of this matchup after Illinois narrowly escaped uh, against Michigan State at home with a 71-68 victory last month? Yeah, I think you look at what Michigan State's done since that game. They're they're 5-1 and one since that game with their lone, wa- lone loss coming uh, in Madison. And I, I think this is one of your toughest games of the year. I, I really do. With the way that Michigan State's playing, with what's at stake coming into the back half of this this Big Ten schedule, going to East Lansing on an afternoon on CBS, like place is going to be absolutely rocking. I mean, you got you you cannot bring your A minus game yeah. for this game. Truly, I, I I think this is the this is a game where you want to see guys kind of put it together on on both ends, and uh, not only are they are they five and one in this stretch over these last six games? But Malik Hall, man, seven straight games and in, in double figures. And we we we've talked about it for years, just his potential. And outside of Walker and Hogard and and Joey Hauser last year, is just hey, if they can find something with him, if he can be aggressive, then he takes that Michigan State team to another level. And that's exactly what he's done. But you go into the Breslin, it's I mean, they play Michigan State basketball there. I mean, they haven't they, their last loss there was was December fifth to to Wisconsin. They you know they they guard at the Breslin. They 
They run their their offense with their floppy actions and their ball screens. And then you know what they do? They they run. Yeah. They they run faster in the resident. They get out in transition. And that's to me, that is the area of this game for for Illinois. Because it's a it's a it's an area where I've seen like a a little bit of a slide since the beginning of the year, locating guys in transition, getting all the way back in transition. You let them get easy buckets. It's you know, it it could be a tough one up in East Lansing. But on the flip side of that, you come out of there, you come out of there with a win. You're talking about a quad one win. Continue to bolster your resume. And uh, you know, you need all these as you as you make a kind of the stretch run. Yeah, after their four and five start start, Mike, they're ten and three. Their three losses are all on the road. Northwestern, Illinois, Wisconsin, all really good teams. They beat Baylor. They beat Indiana State at home. Um, so Illinois is certainly one of their better opponents. They'll play uh, since then at home. But, uh, man, you said, like, what, what are some of your keys? You said it kind of transition defense there. What else is going to be key against the Spartans team from what you've seen from them lately? I think you have to be good in ball screens with your communication. Like, you can't be busting – switches and then having Tyson Walker get going. You can't be busting switches and have Jay Nakin start making threes. You got to try to keep Hogarth out of the paint. Um, and then just like I think Ty Rogers did in the first matchup, I, I want to see how they guard him this time because that did not work for them the yeah. first time around, whether it was Sissoko, Cooper, uh, he just he really hurt them. So maybe they try to play him more straight up, try to keep him off the glass as well. And maybe that opens things up for for a Terrence Chan and for other guys to to find some crevices and find some some driving lanes. So yep. that's, that's really what I'm looking for. But like I said, there's no question. This is a, this is a tough challenge. Mike is Purdue catchable in the big 10. Can you catch them? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Do I think it's likely? No. Um, and the issue is you're a game and a half back right now. Right. And, and if, in a lot of these, these races, these big 10 races, come down to schedule and for for uh for purdue you're talking about a team that from this point on has six home games mm -hmm. and illinois has five road games so that that already doesn't doesn't work in your favor now is it possible yes it's possible but i, I mean you're talking about in these last what nine games of the conference schedule you got to be you got to be near perfect and can i tell you their next five games Go ahead. Home against Indiana, home against Minnesota, at Ohio State, home against Rutgers, at Michigan. Right? So, like, their last three, home against Michigan State, they're still home, at Illinois, home against Wisconsin. Like, that, that they've they've done their difficult work in the Big Ten so far. Yeah, I know they have. And and they're playing really well. Yeah. And that's that's that shouldn't be something for, for Illinois fans or people that watch Illinois where it's like a, a failure if you don't catch – Purdue, or if you drop one of these next five games that, you know, season's over because you can, I mean, this is Purdue is one of probably top two, if not the best team in college basketball. Yeah. How far, so, we, how far Illinois has come as a program, if that's a failure. <laughs> so, right. Right. And, and, and you, they have just like when Kofi was here, they have the biggest guardrail in, in college basketball. I mean, every single game, you're not worried about man, it's Purdue. Maybe they'll have an off shooting night. Maybe they'll, you know, maybe they'll turn it over a little bit. All that stuff doesn't really matter because of what, you know, the the threat that he poses both offensively and defensively. But I'll say this, go, you know, go back to the game and a half, I think is really important to note. You know, it'd be one thing if you were dead even right now. It'd be one thing if the schedules were, were relatively the same. Um, some of that stuff works in Illinois' favor. But go back to 2022 when Illinois clinched a share of the Big Ten. After 11 games, they were up. Mm -hmm. on Wisconsin so when you're up it's a little bit different to where you have a little bit of breathing room you can have a misstep or two if Illinois wants to do this they I mean they quite literally they cannot have a misstep yeah and that's I think that's just a lot to ask with with you know some of the some of the teams that are still left on their schedule you still got to go to Maryland like there's there's a lot of a lot of tough ones there um but but yeah and then even even going back to 22 you you had a game up and then even by the end of it, you needed Nebraska and Alonzo Verge to go into Madison and get that win for you to have a chance. So right. if you're the team that's sitting there saying, we need this, 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 and this, that's that makes the chances a lot less likely. Whereas Purdue, a game and a half up, they're like, 
hey, we, we legitimately tr- control our own destiny and can go and win another Big Ten regular season title. So yeah. um, I hope for the sake of that matchup in Champaign that there is some sort of, you know, I, I guess um, consequences from that game right. in terms of the Big Ten race. But um, I think the Big Ten race has to be on your mind if you're Illinois, but it's also all those other little things. Yeah. You know, closing out games, transition deep, because that then those wins will become a byproduct of that. But if you don't focus on those things, then then there's really no point in talking about a Big Ten race. Yeah, I agree with you. You got a lot of work to do uh, before you get into there. All right, Mike, let's try and do this exercise. We're, we're more than midway through the Big Ten season, and uh, we got to start thinking about the all-Big Ten teams. I, I just think it's a, a great conversation, kind of gets us up to speed. It gets everyone else up to speed about you know where we're at here. So let's, let's try this. Let's try to project it, uh, and let's start with the all-Big Ten first team. How many no doubters, like guys that you have no doubt are going to be first team, do you have right now? No oh. doubt first teams? Yes. Like they'll probably be unanimous? Well, just guys that, um, barring an injury, are definitely going to be on there. Because I, I don't know if, I mean, Jameer Young should be unanimous, but there's always a random voter. Who if you want to tell, like the the the, I think there's two guys that'll be unanimous. Okay. So I'll I'll, I'll start there. I don't know. How, okay. I don't know if you want. I don't know if you want to ping pong this or how you want to do it. No, you go ahead. You go ahead, and I'll I'll just weigh in with what you have to say. My first team. Yeah. All right. So uh, I'll break some news here. We'll go. Uh, we'll go with Zach Eady. Zach Eady. That's a good first. Um, team. and then the other unanimous guy that I think will be on there is Boo Booey. I agree with that. I think he will be, no doubt, unanimous. Um, I, I I have Marcus Damask on on my. Is he your third guy, or I, is it just you're just you're doing your team? I think though I just had those two unanimous, and then you can throw these next three in really any any order you want. Because um, if I had to do Big Ten Player of the Year vote, right? Yeah. We get three picks. I know his team's not very good, but I would probably have Jameer Young three. He's yeah, he was on there for me. Okay. He's, he was my next guy. He was the next guy on my list. Sure. And then this is this is kind of where I struggled a little bit. Um, this is difficult. It is because Start, right? I think there's probably – I got three guys. Three guys. I think it's I think it's A.J. Storr, Terrence Shannon, and Tyson Walker. Okay. Are, are my three. Now – I so I went with AJ Store. I don't blame you. I, I think and, and the reason for it is I just think with the, the big ten games that Terrence has missed, and then like the big ten games where he was trying to like find himself afterwards, is you know, I, I think hurts his case a little bit. Um now if this were mid December, this would be he would be the third unanimous guy. Yeah. Um which I mean, you could like. Here's the thing: like, we aren't told whether to weigh Big Ten play more, but I do think it should. I, I think Big Ten play, I like Big Ten play should matter more. Like, I put more weight into the conference stats, which is why I like that you have Marcus Damask on the first team. Yeah, to be honest with you, and it's hard to keep off a Wisconsin guy. I agree with that, but Terrence has missed like four or five Big Ten games. And he hasn't been great during Big Ten play. He's been good. He's still in my conversation in, 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 in that first team, but I don't blame you for not having him on there. That, that's going to be my toughest call right now is this fourth and fifth spots between Domask, Store, Walker, Shannon. I think you can get Braden Smith into the conversation as well, but um, yeah, I, I don't blame you putting Store. I would probably edge Store right now. Yeah, yeah. And, and I – but again, these those two guys, like I think Terrence could make a run at this. Oh yeah. I think AJ Store, if you watch that Purdue game, he was sitting on the bench at the end of the game. He took a he took a bad shot, guard took him out, and they rolled with I think they rolled with Blackwell at the at the end of that game. So these could be guys who go in two separate directions to finish out the season. And I could totally see Terrence finding his way into the first team with with Marcus. Um, now whether or not the voting shakes out that way, I, I don't know, but, um, just with all things considered with, with store bringing Wisconsin, being a big reason why Wisconsin's where they're at right now. Um, I, 
I, I gave the nod to Store, but you can put Terrence right at the top for for second team for me. If I had to guess where the rest of my media brethren would pick, I think Edie, Bowie, Jameer Young are no doubters. I yeah. think Walker would be on this first team, and I think Store would be on this first team. Yeah, I don't yeah. know if an Illinois guy is on the first team right now because I just don't know if he – like. Do masks non-conference numbers drag him down a little bit? So when you look at the leaderboard, it's not as much. But then you go to conference play, and he's fourth in the scoring. He's tenth in assists. Uh, he's been huge for Illinois. Um, and then Shannon, I, I think people are going to be uncomfortable voting for him. To be honest with you, so I think that's going to play. And he hasn't played uh, nearly to his All American level that he was before this. So uh, can we start the t- second team with Terrence Shannon though? We can. And and my last point on Damask yeah. is. I could totally see a situation where he is second team media, first team coaches, because yeah. a lot of times with coaches, when they, when they do these, it's you're, you're thinking back to how a player made you feel in prep and who else gets the biggest boost because of that. Well, who are, like, I mean, Zach Eady gets, a, gets, gets, gets a quote unquote like, boost, but does Braden, does Coleman, are those other guys that coaches might be more likely to vote for? I think Terrence yeah. is just is another guy that that I think belongs on there. Um, you know, I, I Bowie I, uh, again is yeah. is up there, but my so my second team, I had Terrence. I, I had Braden Smith. Yeah, um, I was thinking about him first team. Yeah, I, I, I he was another guy you could throw him in there with with Walker, Tyson Walker, who's on my on my second team. Um, you re- you ready for this one? Okay, yeah, this is where it gets interesting because I think that in top eight, no doubt, no, like th- that top yeah. eight for me was easy. It's just like where are you putting the guy ranked four through seven or eight? Like that—that yeah. that was the discussion right there. This is where I think the next twelve guys to me is just pick your flavor. I think there's like twelve or thirteen guys, yeah. and you just pick your flavor here. So go for it, Brooks Barnheiser. He was in conversation for me. I love him. Yeah. I love and, him. And, and I think what people don't understand about, about Brooks is obviously, you know, he's he's been good offensively this year. He's been good defensively as well. And I, I saw something the other day where 14 points, six rebounds, two assists, two steals, like hasn't been done since 05-06 in, in the Big Ten Conference, which is which is Pretty incredible, considering the talent that's that's come through this conference. So I have, I have Brooks on there, and then and again, I want to share a story. Some of the oh, Northwestern students were sitting there going, "Does Northwestern get two first team All Big Ten guys?" And I said, I, I turned to him and I go, "I can promise you, as an All Big Ten voter, he won't be first team, but he's on. He's going to be in the second or third team." Yeah. And I had him as my first third team guy. So I, I was really debating who I put second or third team here, and. Uh, I got two other guys I had under consideration, but I'll let you go first. Oh, God, this is where it gets really tough, man. And I, I usually – and it, this is based off of, I think, the, the surprising year that they're having. And I think he's been a – this guy has kind of been a victim of being on bad teams okay. throughout his, his, Big Ten, his Big Ten career. But I got, Dar- I got Dawson Garcia on the second team. Don't hate it. Which – because he's not, he's no longer the great stats, bad team guy, right? Like it's, it's, he's, he's mediocre. great stats, surprisingly competitive, yeah. competitive team guy. All right. Do you want to know who I had over Brooks and Dawson? Yes. I had rink mast. I, I love his game. I love the impact he's made on that team because we knew Wiltshire, Tobinaga, these guys can go off, but they needed, Someone to give him more space, someone to really attack the basket. Like Derek Walker was a really good player. He was not this kind of offensive hub that Rink Mast has become. And and Nebraska's they're probably going to finish as a top half yeah. Big Ten team. And while Tominaga and Wilcher are kind of the, the flamethrowers, Mast is just that consistent piece. He's the leading rebounder, leading assist guy, leading scorer. Um, so I had Rink Mast uh, on my second team. Yeah, I, he was that was that was really the the guy I was debating there because I had mass on my third team. Um, the other guy, and, and maybe it's my bias showing, I, I had Coleman. Yeah. Like th- that was kind of the next tier. I had Barnheiser. You know, Garcia was one of my top third team guys. 
Rink Mast and, and Coleman. Uh, I just love what all those guys bring to their team. Yeah, I had Coleman. I really it was between all three of them. Um, you got Coleman third team. Yeah, I have Coleman. I have Coleman third team. All right. So I think we got this tiered similarly. And now, now that I'm now that I'm looking at it on on paper, I I do not like it. <laughs> no, which I one? I I do not like Garcia's second team. All right, so let's. You can switch. We have we haven't submitted our votes yet. Who would you put in there? I just think Rink and Coleman are. I know that's what I think. I'd rather there. have those guys on my team. Yeah, I agree. Also, a good player. It's like I, I honestly, I, I don't want to. You almost feel like there's bias involved, but I do think it would be super objective. Like let's let's put Coleman on the second team. I think he's been. I think uh, coaches would agree with you. Yeah, he's been that good defensively and. And offensively, so I feel I'll Maybe. be able to sleep tonight. Now yeah. I'll be able to sleep tonight. Yeah, I was um, able to convince you there a little bit. This, uh, who was who was your third third team guy? Okay, <laughs> there's just a bunch of dudes that I feel comfortable putting in here. I am really anti great stat bad team guy. So kudos. Yeah, Kudos to Kanye Clary for for a great season, but I don't think I don't think he's better than Tony Perkins. Um, Lance Jones has been so clutch. I've considered him. I I would probably rather have Ace Baldwin on my team than Kanye Clary. Um, you can make arguments, or whatever. But um, if I had to definitely put a guy here, the Indiana Posts are definitely in the conversation. Renew yeah. Ware. Uh, so I had Renew Khalil Ware. And Tony Perkins rounding out my team. Okay. So I had one of those three. I chose between the Indiana Bigs, which probably isn't fair, but I just do the seat. I just feel like the the season that they're having, it just I agree. It was hard for me to do that. Like that's why I'd love to put Crow over one of those guys. Yeah. yeah. And and Wisconsin is, I think their their balance is gonna end up hurting them when it comes it to <laughs> I don't even mention Tyler Wall in this guy. Yeah, I mean Wall and Crawl, like you know, Klesmith's been really good too. Yeah. Um, but so I, I had uh I had Lance Jones. Don't blame him. Don't I just think I just think when you look at how about the Missouri Valley here, Mike? Yeah. When you look at when you look at the what Purdue was last year, which is very similar to this year. I just think Lance Jones, in addition to Braden Smith and Fletcher Lawyer taking a step forward, like he just adds another dynamic yep. to that team and his ability to shoot the ball and um, defend at a high level and play make when he needs to. I, I think he's, he's definitely on there for me. So three of our 13 all big 10 guys are Missouri Valley transfers. Don't mask your first team masked uh, from Nebraska and Lance Jones from Purdue. And ben, and ben Creaky's in their conversation too. Like I don't have him on here. Creaky didn't, he didn't make my, all Big Ten teams, but um, so who are your who are your last two? So I I had renew. I'd probably would you go renew over where I went renew over where just just because I, I had him first listed. Where's missed a little bit of time? Yeah, I, I don't know. Which feel it feels crazy because where's probably gonna be like a first round pick this year. Correct, um, correct. But he's a really good player. He's he's definitely like top five talented player in the Big Ten. I would have Tony Perkins. I love his game. Yeah, so it was between it was between Perkins and one other guy for me. Mm. And I, I don't know. It's like it's hard for me to sit there and and say that Indiana doesn't deserve to have two guys on the All Big Ten team. Yeah, and then go and put two guys from Minnesota on the All Big Ten team because I just think again with Minnesota. Like you look at like how much Elijah Hawkins has opened things up for them. That is a name sure. I did not have on there, but he's been he's been a great addition, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah, no, he's 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 been awesome. He's he's fifth in the country in assist rate and um and you can see the difference, like how that doesn't put as much strain on Dawson Garcia. And you know, he's he's just opened up a lot for that team. So I I put Hawkins on my on my third team. Um, I don't mind it. 
I don't, I'm not like 100% sure how I feel about that. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there are definitely like, could Bruce Thornton be on, be the last guy on the third team? His team is not could, good. Could Kamwa be on it? Like, it's just hard with, with where those teams are at. I agree. I, 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 I do reward players that are on winning teams. Um, the one thing I would make the argument for Tony Perkins in the same way that I would for Marcus Domask during big 10 play Perkins is averaging 18.6 a game. That's sixth in the big 10 during that time. Um, you know, where is averaging 16 too. So I, I would probably argue those guys over Hawkins, but yeah, but, uh, and, and, and I always got a chance still here, but that's not a great team either. So it's to leave off a crowl or a Klesmet, Tomanaga. <laughs> he just hasn't been as consistent as last year. Like Tomanaga, yeah, you can Tomanaga take, 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 take Elijah out. Take Elijah out. All right. Because I think, because let's make the case here, right? Yeah. Whether it's a guy like Klesmet, Tominaga, who else you just mentioned? Perkins, Perkins. Like I just, I almost feel like, you know, if Blake Hall was playing this way the entire season. Yeah, no, no kidding. <laughs> like that's that's why yeah, to me it feels it almost feels weird with some of these teams. I mean, Purdue has three guys, Illinois has three guys. It's very Wisconsin for them to kind of only have one, and the one guy is like the guy that came in, not from Wisconsin. Right. Um, but, you know, Klesman, I think in big, I think in big 10 play, what, cause I'm, I'm trying to think where Klesman is at. Um, Here's the thing. Wisconsin has one guy in the top 25 of scoring during conference play. And that's AJ store. Yeah. Cause he's all right. Yeah, the guys around 10, that guy's averaging 10 points per game. So I'll say this. I think, I think I want to go Klesmet. And the reason why is as I, you know, watching him in that Nebraska game at Nebraska, like he almost single-handedly won them that game with like his own 11-0 run. I mean, he is. He's averaging 12.5 points per game, 48% from three during Big Ten play. Percent from two. And I, like that is very, very high level. Um, so I, 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 I don't hate it. I think it's I think it's between Klesman and and Perkins probably right. Yeah, I think where I think where will definitely be on one of these. Where's gonna where will probably be on one too. That's just him missing a few games and then the game he comes back they get dog walked at, with against Penn State at home. It's just I think where uh, will definitely could be on the second team media. Like over oh, easily over Mass over Barnheiser like, easily maybe even over Braden Smith. Yeah, because of the numbers, how his NBA pedigree. Um, but I, I think the people that made the biggest impact on the Big Ten this season are probably on this list. I agree. So I feel good. I agree. It. I mean, how many transfers do we have on this list? Let's see. Klesmet, Jones, Garcia, Mass, Walker, Shannon, Store, Young, Damask. It's a decent amount of transfers. And you know who's good at transfers? Brad Underwood. That is a fact. <laughs> he's pretty. He's pretty good at this transfer thing. All right. What, what do we learn from that, Mike? What What, what do we learn? Right, from we learned that? that it's really hard, and you could see. I mean, I, I threw. I kind of threw it together before we we hopped on here, and I think if I get, I was just like, Minnesota is such a like good. I know we still have, they still have ten more games of conference right. play, and they're a they're a pretty good story this year, considering how hot Ben Johnson's seat was coming in and. You know, Hawkins has done a lot for their offense for sure, but um, but I do that's that's why we have you because you can talk me through some of it. Cause I like the more that I saw it on the Excel spreadsheet, the less I liked it for some of those guys. The one thing I would say about the Big Ten, there were some years voting for this where I struggled to find a 13th, 14th, 15th guy. Yeah. I, I don't struggle for that. Like I, I do think the depth of talent probably due to the portal. Uh, has, has really, really helped here. Um, my biggest storylines moving forward is does Terrence Shannon get himself back into that first team? Does he knock out Store? If it's Walker, Walker. Does he knock out his own teammate, Domas? Does he knock out Damask? Yeah. 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 Um, 
So that's a big one for me. And then the coaches usually are going to go with guys like Coleman and Rick Mass and all that. I'm wondering, like, does the media get Rick Mass, Coleman Hawkins, Barnheiser, the love that I, I think they deserve over some guys who are putting up numbers but on, on not very good teams. So uh, that's what I'm always interested to see is, is how much some of these media actually watch a lot of these games. I try to have a Big Ten game on every night just so I – yeah. Just so I know what's happening, I get to see these guys in action. But I know that's that's hard uh, for a lot of people. So um, I think there's gonna be a, a long honorable mention list. Like I'm interested to see, like yeah. this honorable mention list could be longer than it usually goes because you need usually two votes to get honorable mention. Um, so I think it's gonna be a lot longer. There could be 10, 15 guys on that list this year. Yeah, no, I, I agree, and it, it's it reminds me of the AP poll because people go crazy about you know. A loss that week. This right? AP voter put this team here, and this it's those AP voters. And it's I'm not I'm not saying this as a slight to AP voters. There is no way you can watch all 25 of those teams throughout the course of the week. Oh, I would hate to be an AP voter. Yeah, I, so, I would. I would absolutely hate like the guys who are in the studio watching all these games. Those are the ones who should be voting for because they yeah. they watch all these. Yeah, I, I I don't have time to do that. No, and, and yeah, and then you have you know probably some AP voters, and again. No slight to them because I know they can't watch all those games, you know, putting together their poll and going, okay, what did this team do this week? Oh, they were 2-0. and oh. Okay, or what did this team do? Oh, they just dropped their last game. And I think there's probably going to be some of that by the end of the Big Ten season where it's like, what, did, what were this guy's numbers? Like, that's why a Kanye Cleary could sneak onto the third team. That's why, you know, a, a Dawson Garcia could be a second team. You know, it's just – those things happen, but – you know, you hope that the you know the people that have watched the majority of the conference are the ones that kind of absorb most of those votes, but it doesn't kind of doesn't typically work out that way. Just trying to think of the guys I don't have on this list that I had in my all Big Ten preseason, which was top ten. Julian Reese, we didn't put on here. Um, yeah, I had AJ Hogard on my list. I love him, but like they just don't have the shooting around him that they did. You know, with with. Uh, who might think Hauser last year and then Cliff Omar Amori is not on that list because Rutgers is so bad and doesn't have much right he just hasn't gotten a lot better he's, yeah. he's a really good player and he's good at what he does he just hasn't gotten a lot better and with Cliff and and Reese I mean if Maryland is eight and three right now yeah is Reese more of a conversation on third team if, if Rutgers is Somewhere in the top half of the Big Ten, does does Cliff sneak on there? I mean, a lot of it comes down to, or it should come down to, to your team's success as well. All right, Mike, that was a that was a fun exercise. It wasn't yeah. easy, but uh, it was fun to to talk through that stuff. I appreciate you as always, man. We'll catch up next week. Yeah, man, sounds good.